Safeguard our flank. Part 2. Orders to embark for France. As the Kensingtons marched through Le Havre, their steps echoed on the narrow, cobbled streets. Twenty-nine officers and 835 men in small pack order strode along at 120 paces a minute. They had set out that cold autumn day in November to march to Watford and there to take the train to Southampton to eventually form up on the dockside to cheers from the French residents. The battalion's first casualties were received on the 19th of November as they quickly became accustomed to the realities of French line conditions. Their first Christmas passed away standing in trenches knee-deep in water. An attack was planned in company with the French at Vimy to take Uber's Ridge, which turned out to be a very costly one. The fighting was so severe the battalion lost half of those men who set out so confidently in 1914, together with the London Rangers who had also lost 50% of their men, they became amalgamated. When replacements became available from training battalions in Britain, both battalions reformed, taking back their own identities. For most of that year, the Kensingtons operated in lines of communication, unloading supplies at railheads. By late spring the following year, both the Kensingtons and the London Rangers were in training. They were attached to the 56th Division in the 168th Brigade, and this gave the replacements time to become familiar with the old salts, to make the battalion a unified whole once again. Vigorous training schedules were the order of the day, to become proficient with the new Lewis gun, Stokes mortar and Mills bomb. Lectures were given about the new German flamethrower, the gas attacks and how best to use the respirators to resist its worst effects. Steadily, as each company became proficient, they took over the Heberturn, Y and W sectors positioned on the left of the Somme front. The village lay opposite Gomcourt, astride the D27 and D28 roads. I described the battlefield looking from left to right, towards the northeast and German front lines. I also refer to formations when speaking of a group of army units under one command. These recordings concentrate on W sector of the front, describing life in a forward trench, a life lived by the many. Half would not live to see out the following year. During and after the Battle of Luz, Sir John French was thought to be out of tune with his army. And this was the thinking of General Haig, who believed the commander-in-chief allowed a chance at Luz to make a major break in the German line slip away. General Haig undermined the senior man's position by casting doubts about his tactics. This worked, and French was retired. The unfortunate Sir Ian Hamilton, who was the next senior officer, by far the more experienced, was bypassed. Gallipoli had not gone well. It had been dogged by the Navy's unpreparedness, and this allowed Douglas Haig to step into the vacant position created by Sir John French, who retired on the 19th of December 1915. General Joffre wished to retain control of the Allied forces, and to ensure that this would happen he placed the French 6th Army alongside the new British 4th Army under its commander, Lieutenant General Sir Henry Rawlingson. Sir Douglas Haig had an army that had been enlarged from four divisions in August 1914 to 58 two years later. To support this number, it was necessary to have a comparable infrastructure. Haig's headquarters was well behind the front line. 
his army commanders each with their own headquarters, were a further distance away. Communications between commanders and their troops was difficult to maintain, particularly during a battle. Once battle had been initiated, steady, reliable information from the leading troops was impossible. Once the battle plan had been agreed and put into action, there was nothing left to be done but continue with the plan, even if there were, in some instances, an overwhelming reason to alter it. The pre-battle artillery bombardment ordered by General Rawlingson were so intense that most telephone lines were cut even though they had been laid six feet under the ground or two feet below the duckboards in the trenches. During the battle some important messages took over five hours to receive an answer. In instances where the artillery had to change its firing pattern or a communication trench its use, discretion suggested they should be left well alone. A communication trench runs at right angles to the firing line, linking it to the rear, and they are used to give cover and access to the troops manning the front line and passing to the rear for replacements. They provide cover for caterers, weapons supply, runners and for medical orderlies. The area commander directs that one communication trench is for up traffic to the front and another for down to the rear. Messages, unless clear and simple, can be a distraction and some have been known to be a total confusion during the battle. This problem was recognised by General Rawlingson whose doubtfulness about the Territorial Army's efficiency added to his insistence that the big push was to be won on sticking to the plan and by rigid training by rote, taking away any on-the-spot decisions. There is no doubt that the orders issued by the British General Headquarters before the battle were comprehensive. The problem was, were they the right ones? And who, at the front, was to see that they were carried out or changed to take account of changes in the battle? The British Army commander, General Haig, was a cavalryman. The job of battle commander was General Rawlingson's, an infantryman who had just returned from Gallipoli. He had been appointed by Sir John French, who was now retired. General Rawlingson distrusted the quality, resourcefulness and tenor of the Territorial Army and it was in his nature to be dogmatic, insisting upon attrition by his guns rather than surprise, and a rigid wave formation rather than adopting the lie of the land for his infantrymen. His artillery was expected to win the battle, and all other aspects left to tactics set down in detail comprehensively written up in orders of the day which everyone had to keep to. Communications on the battlefield before and after the start of an attack was primitive and extremely unreliable. On the order to move forward the infantry was thereafter lost to strategic command. The generals had no idea what was happening how successful the artillery had been, how efficient the smoke screen laid, or whether the first wave had progressed. It was not known if the timing was being kept to, what casualties had been inflicted, and if the follow-up plan, follow plan was taking regard to what had gone before.